New Smyrna Beach Police Department, Office of Professional Standards. This will be a taped interview in reference to IA case number 2021-006. Today's date is Friday, December 24th, 2021, and the time is 7.03 p.m. The location of this interview is the Command Staff Conference Room at the New Smyrna Beach Police Department. Presently being interviewed is Sergeant Richard Kirkland. I am Lieutenant Mark Severance with the New Smyrna Beach Police Department. Are you aware this interview is being recorded? I am. As a Florida law enforcement officer and notary public of the state of Florida, I'm empowered to take sworn statements. At this time, I'd ask you to raise your right hand to be sworn, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the statement you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. You are being interviewed as a witness to an internal affairs investigation. Since you are not the focus of the investigation, neither union representation or an attorney need be present to represent you. You are required to answer all questions pertaining to your actions or knowledge obtained while an employee of the City of New Smyrna Beach Police Department. Failure to answer any questions may subject you to departmental charges. If any time during this interview you feel that your answers might result in disciplinary action being taken against you, so advise me and the interview will be stopped until representation is obtained. Do you understand that? I do. Okay. <clears throat> so, on December 14, 2021, there was a CAD call uh, asking uh, for police to respond to 143 Canal Street in reference to a suspicious person. Are you familiar with that call? I am. Were you working as a Bravo shift supervisor that evening? I was. So you were filling in for another supervisor, Yes, correct? I was on overtime, correct. Can you recall the details or circumstances of that suspicious person call? Yes, I do. What um, were they? Um, the, the suspicious person call came out, uh, was dispatched to Gull um, about a male bothering customers uh, and asking for money. Um, uh, the, then, I mean, I don't know how far you want me to go. Gull responds and, uh, I mean, that's the circumstances okay. of the call. That's all we know as far as the call goes. Okay, so to you it was pretty nondescript just a, a, a person correct uh, bothering customers yes okay uh, were you ever contacted by officer Galt or officer Beatty during the time frame of this call for service um, I was contacted by officer Beatty after the call for service not during it um, the they the subject uh, had already left the scene um, by the time he called me, but yes. Okay, so you had no knowledge of, of what was going on at the scene at the time when either Officer Galt was there or Officer Beatty was there. Correct. Yeah, I thought so, it was just a suspicious person. They were going to move along, or you know. Okay. That was it. So, uh, Officer, you said Officer Beatty calls you. You believe at the end of his interaction. Correct. With this person. Yes. Okay. Can you describe the phone conversation that you had with Officer Beatty? Um, yeah, he said. Uh, that he was just calling to inform me about what happened. Uh, he said that he was uh, handling a panhandler call. Uh, so obviously immediately I was kind of thinking, you know, what do you mean by panhandler call? Um, he says that the subject was standing on city property uh, and had a sign uh, that said, uh, God bless homeless veterans. Um, he said that the he, the male was refusing to identify himself and that um, he had a firearm and then he, and he, but he did have a valid uh, concealed weapons permit. Um, I asked him, you know, what happened? He explains to me that basically he and Galt detained the, the male with handcuffs. Um, they disarmed him uh, and Come to and confirm that he had a, a valid concealed weapons permit and that in doing so they were able to identify him uh, and ultimately they let him go. Um, I asked BD why he was detained uh, and he told me that he was detained because he was refusing to identify himself and I said well for what crime are you investigating and he said that he was investigating and panhandling and I, he said it's against city ordinance and I said I told him no it's not against city ordinance uh, and he said, well, it's against state statute as well. And I said, it's, it's not against state statute. And um, I told him, I said, that it, from what you're telling me, it sounds like you had no 
legal authority to seize the gentleman or his uh, firearm, uh, disarm him, even run his name. Uh, it doesn't sound like he was doing anything wrong. What was Beatty's reaction to that on the phone? He seemed kind of like, like taken back, like kind of shocked. Like he he didn't. I don't think he grasped that I was telling him uh, that it was not illegal. I think he truly thought it was illegal and uh, was kind of stammering for a second. And then um, at, at one point he hold on one second. Let me refer to the report here. I forget he did say something. Um, Oh, he yeah, he, he did try to tell me that um, that he didn't tell him about the concealed weapons permit at the same time he told him about the gun. So he tried to, he was basically trying to paint the picture that, well, he told me he had a gun, so I was just going to, to seize the gun and, and make it more of an officer safety thing. And I told him that, 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 that mm -hmm. still does not work. If you don't have a crime to investigate, you can't seize the person. Um, and... It ultimately turned out the guy did tell him he had a concealed weapons permit anyway. So. Okay, are you aware of the duration of this interaction, uh, the call? Well, the call came out at 1927 hours, and I got the phone call at 1957, so literally right at a half hour. Okay. Um, from the time dispatched to the time BD's calling me, so I would say shorter, maybe 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes. Something. Okay. Uh, obviously, uh, since you weren't there, you don't have a lot of details of, as to what happened. Uh, based on the phone call that you got from Beatty, uh, other than what he told you, is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, now, obviously, after the fact, I met with you, uh, you being the supervisor that night, and asked you to conduct a supervisory inquiry. That was on the following day, uh, December 15th. Uh, and you entered your findings into an incident summary mm -hmm. and submitted it for further review. Uh, can you provide a synopsis of the key findings in that document? and uh, walk us through what happened? Sure. Um, so the ultimate findings uh, are that the gentleman was not creating a crime, or was not committing a crime. He was completely within his rights. He was on a public sidewalk, and he was simply holding a sign saying, God bless the homeless vets. Wasn't doing anything illegal or suspicious for that matter. Uh, they, they did not have a right to detain him, to seize him, his property. Or, or anything. That, that was my ultimate findings. Uh, the way I got to those findings is I reviewed uh, all the, the video that was recorded by the subject and posted to uh, social media. I also reviewed the uh, both body-worn cameras from Officer Galt and Officer Beatty. Um, essentially, Officer Galt gets on scene first. Uh, he goes to make contact with the male. He tries to summon the male over to him. Uh, the male didn't really appear to respond, uh, so he approaches the male. And they have a brief inter interchange where, where Officer Galt basically tries to get him to move along and uh, tries to convince him. The, the male challenges him and says, I don't have to move along. Um, uh, I don't know if you want me to get into exact words and stuff or you just want me to kind of give the No, the did, uh, did Officer Galt uh, make contact with the business owner or the manager? Not until after he okay. had this you know, verbal kind of back and forth with the, the subject. Uh, I, I believe that he thought he was just going to walk up to the subject and ask him to move along, as we do on a lot of calls. And if the guy doesn't have a problem with it, moves along, no harm, no foul. Well, in this case, the, the gentleman says, I have a right to be here. I'm not going to. So you can see Galt kind of is taken back a little bit. And he said, OK, well, let me go in and talk to the manager. So he does go in and talk to the bar staff. Um, the He tells them the guy says that he's not going to move and that you know he's on the sidewalk. Um, I believe the bar manager tells him, well, he was on our property. And, yeah, so, so there was some dispute over what was their property, what was public property. Correct. Uh, it, it appeared from watching the video that the bar manager, uh, the, the reporting party that I believe his name is Axel, uh, thought that the entire sidewalk belonged to their business. Um, it, it clearly doesn't. It's a public sidewalk. And the subject was actually standing on the far, the farthest away on the sidewalk, he could be from the business. He was literally out by where the parallel parking is. Okay, let, let's back up for a minute. Uh, in your review of the body worn camera videos and the YouTube video, uh, primarily the YouTube video before our officers arrive, uh, did you see the RP Axel 
speak with uh, this subject? Yes, he he goes. He initially tries to handle this incident himself. He goes out and you know asks them to move along. Tells them he can't be there. Uh, and of course, the the gentleman says that he can. He does have has every right to be there. He's on a public sidewalk. Mm -hmm. uh, the Axel guy kind of challenges him and says, "No, this is our sidewalk." And he said, "No, it's not." And basically, when he meets the resistance, Axel says, "Well, fine. I'll just have to call the police then." And so he goes back in the bar. And okay, that brings us back to where we're at then. Yeah. And so Officer Galt talks to uh, Axel inside the bar, and then what happens? Um, he uh, he also called for uh, Officer Beatty to, to respond okay. as backup. And he basically the end of the conversation is, "Well, I'm just gonna have to wait for my my backup to get here." Uh, so he goes back outside. Um, he again confronts the guy, uh, and Officer Beatty comes yeah. up, comes up on, on scene. Uh, you can see Officer Beatty pull pull in. He parks across the street um, on a so perpendicular road there. And um, so, does Officer when Officer Beatty arrives, what does Officer Galt do first? He walks over to Beatty's car and uh, tells him. Uh, let me see here. Let's see exactly what uh, what they said. Give me one second. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, Officer B. Yeah, Officer B. He pull, pulls on scene. Gall explains that he's uh, as they're walking up to the subject that the subject's saying is it's his constitutional right. To be on, stand stand where he's standing. At the manager of the business, says one of his uh, waitresses was afraid to go outside, and I guess wait on the tables. There, there's a couple tables outside. Um, so that was literally what Galt told him. Okay. Um, so then, what happens after they both approach the subject again? So then, BD kind of takes over the call at this uh, at this point. Uh, he makes contact with the guy and does mm -hmm. acknowledge and says that he's on a public uh, sidewalk but the uh, business said that he was begging for money. Um, Meaty had not made contact with the RP. He's just going off at this point of what was said in the uh, CAD call from dispatch. Um, so the he, he said that panhandling is you know against the law and he can't be panhandling out there. Okay. Um, the the gentleman says that you know he wasn't panhandling and that he was within his rights to be there, um, and uh, do you want me to just yes continue? Okay. Yeah. So ultimately, the guy, um, or BD, tells the guy that you know he can't be there and that he needs his name and uh, and information. The guy says that he's not going to identify himself. They go back and forth a few times. Um, BD, you know, basically tells him threatens him that he's going to go to jail if he doesn't give him his, his identification uh, because he's there investigating a crime to which he claims the business started the complaint. Um, so the the male, I, I think, could see that he was going to be put into handcuffs, so he alerts the officers that, um, or at least he perceived he was going to be put into handcuffs, I should say. He alerts the officers that he is armed and that he is lawfully armed. He has a concealed weapons permit, and he kind of puts his arms out in front of him. Okay. Officer Beatty, uh, and he makes it an exaggerated movement. He says, here's my hands out here. And Officer Beatty goes to, you know, take the gun out of his pocket. Um, I, I think that the male maybe he felt a little uncomfortable with um, the officers taking the gun out of his pocket with his hands just being there. Right. So he actually suggests, he guys, guys, maybe I should be put in handcuffs. So then you see Officer Galt. That's when he comes in and puts the guy in handcuffs while Beatty's retrieving the firearm, and then ultimately searches the mail, uh, locates, I believe, some magazines in another pocket, uh, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> um, the mail, the, the, d during the detention and search, says, I do not consent to any searches or seizures. Um, he's told them several times that you know he's within his rights, and this, this is a violation of his rights. He, he, he was, you know, basically broadcasting that. So sometimes. after they handcuff him in front of the, uh, the New Smyrna Brewery there, uh, what happens? Um, well, I, I forgot to note, as they were going to handcuff him, Officer Beatty takes his sign out of his hand and puts it okay. like on the pole. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that really is of note. Uh, but ultimately, they walk, they walk him across the street 
to where Officer Beatty parked up his patrol car. Okay. Um, Officer Beatty uh, exp uh, is explaining to him that this is why the, is the reason as to why he's getting arrested, or uh, why he's been detained, I should say, not arrested. Right. Uh, and the guy says, well, since you have my firearm, I'll go ahead and give you, let you get my concealed weapons permit. And he tells him, it's in my wallet, in my pocket. He directs Beatty to the wallet and ultimately gets his... Uh, BD gets his uh, concealed weapons permit. He uses that to identify him by name and date of birth. Um, he he runs him on teletype and confirms that he's not wanted. Um, he doesn't run the concealed weapons permit number to, to verify that it's valid. Okay. Um, but he did, he does verify that the mail is not wanted. So he uses that to say, okay, now since you've identified yourself. I'm going to let you go, basically. That's when they unsecure him. Uh, he B actually hands him his firearm back and tells him to put it in his pocket. Again, you can see the subject's kind of uncomfortable with that, but right. ultimately he does take the gun, put it in his pocket, and again, pronounces his hand movement, saying, I'm going to, I think he put it up on the police car, so I'll leave my hand right here. And then BD went to go make contact with the business. Okay. Um, so BD goes into the business and makes contact with the manager Axel. Is that correct? Yes. What was? Can you describe that interaction? Um, let me. Uh, yeah, you can here. refer to your report. Uh, so yeah, BD asks if he was at, immediately asked the manager was he was the male seen asking for money, uh, and the the bar manager said no, I can't, I don't think he was asking for money, but he was, uh, it reiterates that one of his waitresses was nervous to go outside or whatever. Um, BD then says immediately that he's going to call the sergeant, me, to kind of, I guess, run it by me. Um, but if he was not on their property, not asking for money, there wasn't much that he could do. They couldn't, he couldn't make him leave. So he kind of was telling the guy, if he's not asking for money, then we have no law violation and I can't make him, uh, make him move along or anything. Okay. In his mind is what he right. was thinking. Um, then he, that's when Officer Beatty leaves and goes back to the car. Um, the I forgot to mention actually. Let me let me go back. Okay. Uh, when he was uh, when they escorted him over to the car, uh, the guy did make a statement. He said, uh, "I just want to put you guys on notice that you're violating my constitutional rights, and that I would proceed. Or if I were you, I would proceed with caution from here forward. Something to those lines." And uh, BD, you know, kind of argues with him and tells him, no, we're not violating your rights because you were panhandling and so okay. on and so forth. Uh, so ultimately, BD comes back over and the guy's already unhandcuffed as before. He's got his gun. He tells him, since you weren't panhandling and asking for money, and I've got, I had, I already identified you, basically, that he wasn't, that he wasn't going to be detained any further. And the guy asked if he was free to leave. Um, he had originally asked for a card from BD. He said he would go get him a car, and he goes in the car. That's actually when B calls me, and the subject I think was kind of almost maybe tired of waiting, and he says he asked Officer Galt for what their names were, right. and then he just says, "I don't need a card, I'll just leave," and then he walks away. Okay, uh, going back to Officer Galt, if, if I'm going to ask you a couple questions, okay, uh, if Officer Galt had not called Officer Beatty to come to the scene, uh, what do you think would have happened? It appeared to me that uh, Officer Galt kind of knew he was in over his head. I don't think he really knew how to proceed. Um, that's why he called for backup. Uh, I think he was relying on a more senior officer to kind of guide him on, and what to do. Uh, if he did not do that, I would like to think that he would have called me and uh, or the corporal, one or the other. I, actually, there was no corporal working that night. So uh, call me for advice on how to proceed. Okay. I don't see Officer Gall going to the extent uh, that Officer Beatty did on his own. He, he clearly had that opportunity several times. He went back out of the business, I think, twice. Um, he, he wasn't t forcing the issue at all. Did he, he talk to any of, customers uh, outside about what was going on? You recall? Yeah, he he. Uh, there was one customer that was uh, that was said he had been out there the whole time, and I think he asked him. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think he asked yeah. him if he saw him okay. asking for money, and the guy said no. He's just been there the whole time. Okay. Um, 
I, I'd, I'd have to go back and look at the video. I don't nothing that really jumps out at me, but yeah, okay. I think he did. Uh, do you? Let me back up here. Uh, did Officer Galt ever mention anything about panhandling? Do you recall that? At the beginning of his interaction with uh, the subject? Um, my report here. Okay. He did, uh, he tells him, the, <clears throat> the subject tells Officer Galt that he's on the public sidewalk and is just saying, God bless the, the homeless vets. Galt tells him that he cannot stand in the same place and say the same thing over and over. Then goes on to tell him that he cannot beg for money because it's against city ordinance. Okay. Um, the male told Galt that he was not begging for money and that it would still be illegal because the, that city ordinance would be unconstitutional if it existed. Um, Okay we've, we've, okay, we've already talked about Officer Beatty and the phone call part that uh, happened. Uh, do you feel that Officer Beatty and Officer Galt uh, believe that panhandling was a, currently a city ordinance? Absolutely. I, I, they both said it um, non-prompted in the, on their body-worn cameras at separate times. Um, I, I don't know where they would get that impression or where they may have learned that, but they definitely were under the impression that uh, they did have legal authority to seize him based on that uh, assumption. I don't think either one of them did anything um, intentionally wrong. I think that they were more or less ignorant that the fact that it is that panhandling is just not illegal. We can't detain based on that. Uh, so I think they were, they were just operating on bad assumptions. Okay. Do you think that uh, Officer Beatty uh, made the decision to detain this subject uh, because of his refusal to identify himself? Yes. I, I think that Officer Beatty thought that he had the legal right to identify him because he was, in his mind, investigating a crime. Uh, uh, and that's why he was ultimately going to detain him. Uh, it kind of took a weird turn because BD went for the gun immediately uh, instead of going for handcuffs immediately, and then the get mail ultimately asked to be handcuffed. Right. Um, that, yeah. So it was, uh, but I do think that he was absolutely going down that path. That's what he was going to do. Okay. Can you summarize the policy violation? You proffered a, a couple of uh, policy violations. The one. Uh, can you read that from the record there? Uh, the group two. The group two M violation of rules, orders, etc. Issued by the city commission. Um, you know, it's basically he he violated our rules and policies and procedures regulations by ultimately going uh, against what he did uh, for preliminary and follow up investigations. Um, he's. He, he basically detained someone without the legal authority to do so. Um, so clearly in violation of that policy. Um, it, I mean, as far as Officer Galt, I do think that he also uh, had, a, had a duty to recognize that what was going on was not okay. But again, I think he was naive and ignorant to the fact that Panhandling is not against the law, and we cannot enforce a panhandling complaint by uh, de detaining people. So I think that um, they were they were operating under the impression that they what they were doing was correct, but we're just misinformed. Okay, I'm just going to ask you straight: Are you of the opinion that Officer Beatty and Officer Galt uh, violated this subject's civil rights based on? Your review of the video evidence. Yes, they absolutely did. Um, again, I don't think it was intentional or malicious. I think that they thought what they were doing was right and that it just simply wasn't the case. Okay, do you have anything further you'd like to add to this? No, I don't think so. Okay, this concludes the interview. As this investigation is continuing, you are ordered not to discuss any portion of this investigation except with legal counsel or your personal representative. Any request to deviate from this instruction must be directed to your commanding officer. Do you understand that? I do.
The time is 7.28, and I'm going to terminate the recording at this time.